All righty. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Todd Bohannon. I'm a, hello, hello. It's so good to see you guys. Um, I'm a volunteer educator with uh, REEF, the REEF Environmental Education Foundation. And um, we're here today for our first live stream from uh, Grouper Moon 2023. Uh, right now I'm um, on Little Cayman. I just arrived here yesterday after flying on a red eye, which means I flew all night from Seattle to Miami. And then from Miami, I flew here, uh, where I flew to Grand and then from Grand to here. Um, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, as soon as I got here yesterday, I was able to hop onto the boat with a bunch of researchers and we went out and took a look at the fish. And um, later on in this live stream, I'm gonna share with you guys some of the video uh, that I took. Um, but we have a few guests that I want to that uh, I'm going to introduce to you guys today, and and you'll you'll have opportunities to ask questions. If you guys have questions during the live stream, um, you can raise your hand, or uh, you can let your teacher know, and they can pop it in the chat, and then I can call on you guys. But we'll also have time for questions at the end. But if you if you have something that comes up, you want to ask a question, don't hesitate. Just you know, raise your hand. Uh, that's what we're here for. You know, to to engage with you guys. Um, so I'm really excited that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, the first person I want to introduce you guys to uh, is Dr. Croy McCoy. Good right. morning, everyone. Hi, Dr. McCoy. How are you? I'm doing great. Yourself? Good. So the first thing that I like to do is kind of give a big picture of what's happening so far here on the, uh, on the aggregation. So when did, when did you, with the DOE, so maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can do a big picture. Well, I work at the DOE, I've been there almost 28 years and I head up most of the projects on the marine side of it, which includes Grouper Moon. Um, we took two boats from Grand Cayman over to Little Cayman, our big boat, which came over on Friday and the smaller one on Saturday. These boats are used to do all of her research in the BRAC and also in Low Cayman. Okay. And can you just tell, like, how long have you been with DOE? What, how did... Well, I started in 1995, actually. <laughs> My true age is showing up now. I've been there. <laughs> been, there. been in uh, doing research in our reefs and fish and mangroves, coral reefs for the last 20, almost 20 years, so. How did you get into that? What, what was sort of your path? Well, I was born in BRAC. I attended Spot Bay Primary in the high school. And I started out just diving with my family here in Little Cayman. And the interest just went from there, trying to understand, you know, marine biology, if you want to put it in context, and coral reefs and fish behavior and fish, the ecology of fish and stuff. And then I went off to university after that. It spurred off my interest in understanding oceanic systems. So. And so you went to university. What degree did you get? I did a marine biology, marine science degree. Where, did, where did you go? You know, Florida, Florida, University of Tampa. Okay. And then I went on to graduate school in North Wales, University of Wales, do my master's degree. Mm -hmm. Then I continued that to do my PhD at Bangor University in the UK, in Northern Wales again. And here I am working with the DOE still and doing research and finding ways that we can um, help Mother Nature that we all have uh, not only NASA groupers with coral reefs and other species of fish and mangroves and seagrasses in for you all and your kids and the future these islands. Well, and so what is your, I guess, title? What, what is your position on this project? And I'm one of the, uh, from the DOE side, I'm the, um, the PI principal investigator. And that along with our uh, reef with Dr. Bryce, or Professor Simmons now, mm -hmm. and um, Dr. Scott Heppel mm -hmm. and Dr. Christy Simmons. So four of us runs it from different aspects of it. And so have you guys been out on the aggregation already? Yeah, we started from uh, 
Sunday. Sunday. Really, really when we um, all kicked into gear, getting everything started, and we were in Brock yesterday. So what does that mean, getting things started? What What are you doing? Um, well, with any anything you start off the first time, you work with all the crooks and wrinkles. <laughs> and, stuff. and nothing works perfect in the world. You can plan as much as you want. You know, boats break, uh, dive equipment break, research equipment break, and you just got to get everything working and right. well oiled for the rest of the week leading yeah. up to the, the spawning and everything. So, and so, as you guys know, um, uh, the Group of Moon Project is a collaboration between the DOE in the Cayman Islands and Reef, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. So there's two sets of researchers here on the project every year working on this together. Um, how does it, what do you guys do to start? Like, what do you, what are you out there doing with those fish? Initially, we, uh, well, we started this project using AI with uh, fish faces, just seeing as all. Uh, okay, so AI fish faces. We're going to slow down for, yeah. for a moment. What is, so let's start with fish faces. What is, what do you mean that you're going out there and are you looking at their faces? Every individual fish. Though we look the same, just like human beings, yeah. Um, your face looks different from mine. You look different from someone else. So, what we do, we take video with GoPros and of all as much fishes as we can possibly uh, get within the the diving. So you're going down. You've got a GoPro camera, and you're taking video of the of the fishes' faces. Yeah, and what we do, we come back and download that and run it through software facial recognition using, we'd say AI, which is just artificial, artificial intelligence. And it recognizes that fish that returns annually. Before that, we used to use, uh, um, it's one way of also getting population estimates of how much fish is there. But not only that, we're interested in the, they keep returning each year. So and is it kind of like a fish Facebook? A bit, yeah. If it's like, I mean, because you're yeah. creating, you're creating a, a, a your category or your yeah, catalog of cataloging who, who all, attend, all the fish. Who, yeah, who attends there? And then, yeah. and then you're able to see if they're coming back. Yeah. In subsequent exactly. years. Yeah. So yeah. before, okay. So before, when when that was happening, that uh, they were doing that just with pictures, but now we're doing it with pans. And you said something about AI. What do you mean that AI is I mean, helping? Just artificial intelligence. We have software that we run the video through that recognizes each um, fish repetitively. So we know that fish was here last year and it was here again this year. So you don't have to per you don't have, have to actually go and, and look at them. The AI will identify them we'll for you. Identify the person. And what's the benefit of that for the project? Um, it's a quick and easy way to collect a lot of data really quick yeah. and accuracy yeah and it also gives us um, population estimates we used to uh, we use uh temporary fly tags the tag and recapture before mm -hmm. and we sort of trying to move away from that where um, it's non-invasive even though these are pretty much harmless um it's still so these are the tags that Croy is talking about they're called floy tags and uh they how many put out like a hundred i think every yeah, year we, we try to put out a hundred um, right away, first thing um, when we get here, and let the population mix, and then we go and, and do counts. It looks like we have a question. Hey, Cayman Prep, did you guys have a question? If you unmute yourselves, you can go ahead and ask. No? Do you want me to try to unmute you? Oh, oh. What's the question? How many NASA grouper are there? That's a great question. Did we, what was the final number that you guys came up with last year? Well, when the project started, because of fishing pressure, the low Cayman aggregation was just around a thousand or so, and we uh, 
took a lot of work and a lot of science and get a management plan in place. But right now we estimate the populations like seven, seven or 8,000 fish. And the BRAC was actually down to less than just a few hundred. And that has, you know, following the same pattern as low commando lag way behind over the years. It took us about 10 years before we started seeing the population increase and low command has tripled um, and BRAC is um, upwards of you know, several thousand fish easily from a few hundred. We'll have more estimates at the end of this project and exactly what the population status is of um, BRAC, but we would imagine it's gonna be up in you know, three, three thousand, three or 4,000 fish on BRAC. On BRAC. Really? Yeah. Now, you uh, you guys went out there yesterday, is that right? Yeah. And, and what did, and what were you happy with what you saw? Yeah, very happy. There was um, just around where we have these uh, listening devices. Oh, hold on once. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you because we have a question. Cayman Prep, what's your question? I cannot hear you. That's straight. Oh, I don't know why I can't hear you. Let me try removing you and bringing you back. For some reason, it's not, it's your audio isn't working now. And I don't know why it was working a minute ago. I'm so sorry. Can you, can you type, can you type it into the chat? There's a question mark there. So while, while we're figuring out what's going on with that audio, that's so strange. It was just working. Um, we have a question from uh, the Cayman International School from Miss uh, Amanda's class. <clears throat> oh, they're running out. They had run out for. Okay, oh, so okay. they said, "Have they spawned yet?" No. Um, the population keeps increasing right up to the full moon and just after, and the fish. Uh, we say hydrate is when they, the eggs they get real puffy stomachs and they usually spawn, though we, we haven't uh, nailed that down to a fine art yet, they usually uh, spawn two or three nights after the full moon. Full moon was uh, yesterday. Okay. So um, about two more days they should spawn and they'll, they'll spawn every night for about three nights. But the population of Low Cayman is quite high. It's, uh, you know, like probably around 7,000 fish or more. And we're hoping to see more spawning, which they will um, over several more nights, but that's left up to mother nature. All right. Um, there's a question from Cayman Prep. Um, do you have one famous fish? There's several famous fish on the site that return yeah. annually. Um, we used to have one named Phantom. He had one side white, one side dark. Really? <laughs> and there's this one that the shark took a big chunk out of him. And he's still there and comes and shows up. And So he's got like a big a big bite out of the big back. A big bite out of them. Every, every fish, um, if you look closely to them, there's something different about them. That's how they identify even sharks, whales, and everything. So there's loads of famous fish on there that we see annually that because uh, NASA groupers, we consider them the puppies of the sea that can be domesticated, like how you have a little pup or a cat or anything like that. So you recognize them every year because of their features that they're different from the rest. And there's lots like that. And you almost feel like they recognize you because they come right up to you, at least a little Cayman. The population in Brack is a little more uh, skittish or shy, if you want to call uh -huh. it that. So you don't get nowhere near as near as you do with the population in Low Cayman, where they almost want to interact with you, which is a, a special thing about NASA groupers. So I, I also heard uh, one of the, when we were on the boat yesterday, one of the researchers saw a fish called Hula. <clears throat> yeah, she has like a, a band halfway down midship on the, on the fish, and she's been around probably uh, 12 or 15 years now. That goes back to the beginning when that fish used to show up. So, really that long yeah awesome so we, we have a couple of other questions came in preps asking um how heavy do they get they get fairly large um 
the largest ones we have are in Barack, maybe because they they shy away from people, so they don't get caught as quick. Right. But um, the average weight of the uh, Nassau groupers in off the west end of Little Cayman are probably um, 12, 14 pounds. They're a little smaller. The ones in Brack are a little larger. But they, they get up pretty heavy. Well, um, since we were talking about the Brack, I have some video that you guys shot yesterday on yeah. the Brack. I'm going to share some of that really quick. So, guys, hold on one moment. I'm going to I'm going to share some video of the aggregation that's on um, Cayman Brack. Now, I'm told this is stereo video, but I'm not sure what that means. Um, we started a project we used to use lasers that were measured to get an estimate of distance when you shine it on the fish mm -hmm. and then we would extrapolate to get the full length of the fish. Stereo video is a bit like your two eyes, how you look at something. And you can estimate the distance in between that. I see. So we have two cameras that are synchronized on a uh, platform that we go up to the fish and take video of it to get the size class now. So we've moved on to a little more complicated system to get better data. And that's what we try to do as researchers. We look for better ways to do things to get more out of data. I see. So this is the smaller aggregation on, on the BRAC, um, but what what's different about it in these last few years compared to previous? You mean in the BRAC? Yeah. Well, for one, you, the, the population was so low 10 years ago, and we took a long time to see that increase in, in, our, in the population over there. But the, uh, and does that correlate like the catch limits and, and the protections that have been put on to the... Yeah, the, the, the management plan has slot sizes. You know, we, we don't take the, um, the big breeders or big mamas, whatever you want to call them. And right. we don't take the juveniles. So the slot size of... Uh, they get to 16 to 24 inches, or the, not the teenagers, but they at least re reach um, reproductive status and have a chance to continue to, con to contribute to the uh, population. Uh, uh, and there's a bag limit we put onto it also outside of the season. And it's working really well. I mean, the population is still increasing annually. So um, I see there's a question here. What the que I'm going to, so this, this, Say goodbye to that video because we're going to take off from there and come back to us. Okay, so um, uh, one of the questions was how many fish have spawned? So maybe let's just talk briefly about what, what actually happens. Well, any uh, NASA group of that, that have reached reproductive status shows up at the site. We've proven that with all of the, over the last 18 years looking at the data. So what we got to realize, your whole reproductive population mm -hmm. is at this one site. That's why they get fished so heavily, and that's what uh, you know leads to this demise of population regionally. Mm -hmm. You know, originally there was like 50 plus, and over 30 of them have disappeared because of this fact. And they're they're predictable, which means they gather at one spot, certain time, and they just get fished out. And that's the whole re reproductive effort for that one year you know they don't do it every month they do it once a year sometimes maybe twice maximum so in that sense you know all of the nasa groupers that are capable of having babies are going to be at the west in the low cayman also in the brack at the east end and then grand cayman at the east end too so does that mean that they all they all spawn at the same time? Yeah, they do. It's um external fertilization where the uh, the female releases her eggs and the uh, the male releases his gametes and they mix together. So we call it a dance. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of twists going up a little bit, and then there's a window of 35 to 45 days where it's planktonic. It just floats in the ocean. The eggs hatch after like 24 hours. They're mm -hmm. free swimming, and from there, they settle out on our reefs, so. Awesome. That was a great question, you guys. Um, I wanna thank uh, Dr. McCoy for being here and, and talking to you guys. And I wanna introduce you guys to, was there another question you had before we, we move on? I see a hand. 
but I, unfortunately, came preps, mic isn't working. Okay, if you have a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Oh, here we have someone coming up. No? Okay, that's all right. Um, anyway, thank you so much for being well, thank here. Thank you for having and, me. And we'll, um, we will be sharing video uh, later this week of the actual spawning. And so you'll see what uh, Dr. McCoy was talking about uh, with that sort of dance that, yeah. you were, that you were explaining. All right, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, we have another scientist who's gonna join us, another principal investigator on the, on the project, Dr. Simmons. Well, hi. Hi, friends, how are you? Good to see you all. Hey, yeah. my friends, how are you all? All right, <laughs> I love the energy, you all. So. Um, kind of big picture, what, what's happened so far on the project? You, when did you get here? What's going on? Yeah, so we've been here for a, a couple of days now. Uh, we're, our team kind of trickles in. We've got a small plane that we have to take from Grand over to uh, Little Cayman. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes it takes quite a bit of, of, of effort and many planes to get all of our people and all of our equipment over to this island to start diving. At the same time that we're bringing people over on the plane, the Cayman Islands Department of the Environment is bringing boats over. Mm. So we have two different Cayman Islands Department of Environment vessels that we're using for our research here. And so how many people do you think are here this year on the project? Oh, uh, gosh, we've got uh, close to 20 between wow. the Department of Environment staff, scientists and researchers, and then uh, our component, which is, of course, some academics, scientists, and educators from Reef. So it takes it takes a village, literally. We've got a huge number of people from lots of different places coming in to do the work. Awesome. Yeah, so, so we're now all here, mm -hmm. and we've been diving for the last couple of days, and we've been using uh, the two, two vessels that the Cayman Islands government brought over, one which is the RV Seakeeper, which is it's their large research boat, and that's the boat that we put most of our divers on that helps us to do uh, a large diving platform so we can do research and diving out at the uh, little Cayman spawning site. At the same time, for the last two days, we've been sending a boat over to Cayman Brac, mm -hmm. and we've been fielding a team of divers over there as well to collect data at the exact same time. So the same time we have divers in the water on Little Cayman, we've got divers over in the water in, in Cayman Brac. Awesome. So um, Dr. McCoy started talking about that you guys are creating a fish Facebook. Well, can, can you can you talk a little bit about how you're doing that? What this is the tool that you're using. This right? is this is the tool. So, so what happens? Yeah. So um, you probably all have one of these at home, or you've seen one of these. This is just a GoPro, right? Just just a small action camera that's in it in an underwater case, and we've got it on a selfie stick, right? So um, of course we're not actually taking selfies of ourselves most of the time. Sometimes we might, <laughs> but most of the time what we're trying to do is we're going to capture images of the sides of fish. Right. So like you and like me and like Todd and Croy, we all look very different mm -hmm. and we can tell, you can tell it's me, you can tell it's Todd, you can tell it's Croy just because of the way you look. Well, inside your head is artificial intelligence, except for it's facial intelligence, right? <laughs> so you, because you can tell us apart based on our facial features, we can actually do the exact same with grouper. It turns out that the stripes and patterns on the sides of grouper are consistent across time. They, they keep their same patterns. So it and doesn't change. It and doesn't change. Right. And so Croy mentioned hula, right? Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Yeah. It's an extreme example of a pattern on the sides of fish, but all fish have unique patterns that maintain over, over days, months, years. And we can use artificial intelligence along with our GoPro to capture that information and keep track of individuals at the aggregation site through time. So we put a whole bunch of divers in the water, mm -hmm. filming a whole bunch of fish, and we take all of that footage back to the lab and we use artificial intelligence to process that footage so we can keep track of individuals. So the artificial intelligence, the computers say, okay, well, you found Bob the fish and Bob the fish. We've seen him for the last five years. He's grown three centimeters. We get all of that information by using just GoPros and selfie sticks underwater. Now, but you're also tagging fish, right? We are. Can you talk a little bit about what, 
what that is sure. and so, why you're doing it. Yeah, so so Dr. McCoy, Dr. Croy, he mentioned that we are constantly trying to evolve the science that we're doing so we can get new and better data. But it's also important that we try and involve the science we do so we can have as little impact on the fish while they're spawning as possible. Because of course, we wanna let them do their thing so they can create as many babies as possible so that the Cayman Islands gets uh, as many new fish as possible arriving back to their population. One of the ways that we collect information on the number of fish that are out there is through these tags. This is just two of them. We call them jewelry. And we've been, for the last 10 years or so, we've been tagging a very small number of fish with these things, with these little tags, and we implant them in the back of their fish with divers, using a little spear to poke them in the back. And then those tags are not designed to last years. They're designed to last weeks. We don't want them to last years. All, all we want is for these to be in the sides of fishes so that we can then send divers down and do counts of fish mm -hmm. and keep track of how many of those fish have tags. So here's a little math for you, you guys ready? If I tag 100 fish, if yeah. I put 100 fish tags out in fish and then I count 100 fish of that population because it's well mixed now. And of the 100 fish that I count, 10 of them are tagged. What proportion of the population is tagged? If I have 100 fish and 10 of them have tags, it's probably 10%, right? right? And if I know that I've tagged 10% of my population and I put out 100 tags, mm -hmm. that means that there's 1,000 fish in the population. Right. Right. So this tagging that we do allows us to come up with a mark recapture estimate of population size. Now, I said we're trying to evolve the science, yeah. right? So this... Is, is minimally impactful to the fish, mm -hmm. but it's still impactful. Sure. We, we want to get rid of the jewelry eventually. And so that's why we're moving to the facial recognition. Because if we can do the same thing just with our cameras and artificial intelligence to keep track of individual fish through time, then we don't need to use tags at all. And so we've been rapidly evolving that artificial intelligence over the last three years to start to demonstrate that it will replace these tags. So the hope is by next year, we'll never have to use these. Again. Really, really? Yeah. So this may be the last year tagging. That's the hope. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Um, so what happens next? Or, well, okay, no, let's not go there yet. What, what's the typical day for you guys going out there on, on the boat? What it, are you guys just in the water constantly? Or what do you, tell me kind of, how does that go? How does it go? Sure, yeah, so, so as a general rule, we're, we're trying to do as a team, a whole whole team, we're trying to do three dives a day. We'll do an eight o'clock dive, a one o'clock dive, and then a, a dusk dive, whenever that happens. Now, not every diver goes on every dive, but collectively we try and field three teams of divers per day. That's a lot of diving. It's a lot of diving, and each dive lasts about, we're at the bottom down with the fish for about 25 minutes or so. And then we spend another half that amount of time just getting to the fish and then coming back up to the boat safely. Of course, it's, it's fairly deep diving, so... We, we are very safe about how we do our diving. We take safety very seriously. So that, that means it takes time to get down to the fish and to get back. So we're doing that three times a day. But here's the thing. Winter mm. in Cayman is not very predictable. Right. So some days, because of the weather, because of the sea state, because of the big waves, we may not be able to get out. Or it may be that we can use the, the sea keeper, the large research vessel, but maybe not the small research vessel. So we have to adapt to what the weather is doing and what the fish are doing. So it changes every day. So a huge part of our research is constantly getting together and, and reevaluating and recreating the plan. So it's, it's a constant plan in motion all the time. It seems like that's a, a lot of variables for you guys to be managing at one time. The, is that, are you doing all of that in your head or do you guys have, do you delegate the, those jobs out? How, how does, how do you keep that all together? Yeah. So we, so it's, it's a, it's a team effort, right. of course. And you know, there, there are specialists. So we, we leave it up to the department of environment. If, if they, if they say we can't take the boat out, we don't take the boat out. That's, that's not our, you know, there are experts at boat operations and there are experts at doing science. And so we've got a collective of people that all work together. It's really amazing actually to see the teamwork. Yeah. Like the fact that you've got roughly 20 people in the field that are all contributing to this project and collectively coming up with game plans and evolving those game plans on the fly. It's really amazing that we're able to pull it off. And it's because we all work together very well as a team. Yeah, it's amazing. And and you guys are part of that team just by being here with us um, and participating in these live streams. The, the, uh, 
for, for this project to be successful, you know, we, we, we really, it, it takes everybody to take care of and to conserve um, something as important as the Nassau grouper and, and the coral reefs that, that are here on Cayman Islands. Now, I have some video that I took yesterday of the aggregation that I want to share, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what we're, what we're seeing. Absolutely. So, hold on one second, and I'm going to share some video. Where was this? Is this from Little Cayman or is nope. this Cayman? So this Cayman is Rock? this is last night here. Uh, okay. okay, so this is an example of GoPro footage that, that you might get from the aggregation. One bagger is operating it, and then you're seeing uh, that's Dr. Dr. University uh, there. And what we're doing when when we go on these dives is we're sending a series of divers down deep. One of those divers has that same And they're trying to capture individual fish. With the GoPro, they're wide angle, which means you really want to get the most possible of the fish so you can really pick up the information. So the divers are swimming around the dive site, of course, always in buddy pairs, safety is usually important. Uh, but, but together, we're getting footage of it. Here's an example of this diver coming up on a fish, and you can see they're trying to get the sides to have So, you often see, and here's a great example, you see how they're just off in the distance now, I hope you guys can see this, there's a huge band of mass up up in the waterfall, and are all milling around together. So that is that band that runs the length of the aggregate, as far as you can see it, in either direction, and where this dive but there's also a bunch of fish that will on the pipeline here. And they're probably there because they're, they're, they're visiting a cleaning station. So there's a bunch of fish. They go to specific areas of the reef in order to get clean, like you would take your car into a cleaning station. Right. The fish will do that. So they'll come down onto the reef and small gobies. And so it's there that we can get close to them and catch that fish. But the vast majority of the fish that we're seeing right now are up in that main. And where and is this where they're at all day long? Do you guys have to look for them? Or they, do they move around? What do they go down? Do they go down? Yeah, it changes all the time. And do you guys think that that's related to conditions or I think it's related to first of all, you're asking great questions. And, and with science, we're still trying to figure out a lot of these terms, right? So, so we're, we're already at the cutting edge of what we have for the behavior of the population. And yeah, so it does change from day to day. We think that um, when it's calm, like it is right now, in this in this time, yes, they tend to band up because they don't have to fight against each other. Why do they band up? Well, they get together and, you know, they band above the, the ground and they're checking each other out. So it's like going to a bar, or they're visiting each other, right. trying to figure out who they want to be there. And then, which is really neat because they're a solitary fish the whole year, right? And so just on these few days of the year, they get together. But other other than that, if they saw each other, they would they would fight. They would, they would like yeah, no, they would they were territorial. They would protect their, their territory. Right? Exactly right, and and that's part of why we think they take on the Nassau group on the whole reef. This is not how they work. They have a very different pattern. You can see now the tigers getting really close to the fish in the band. That's Dr. Christy Patton has had this every year. So they'll, they'll, they'll take on this different color pattern, and part of why we think they do that is to make everybody else like, hey, I'm a lover in the fight. Right? I don't want to fight, right? I think the other person is going to be able to reach so it's just a quick, a quick and easy way for them to signal what they're red attention. And you, you can see now, as, as the divers up in the band, this time of year, as they move on, they get so focused on that reproduction, they ignore the divers. They're crazy close to these fish, and they just don't. So, uh, that was amazing footage, and thank you for that explanation. And it looks like we have a new class that joined us, the Year 12 Marine Sciences class. 
um, that are headed to CCMI tomorrow. That's exciting. Oh, that is awesome. Um, but it, as, as we're talking, if you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hands and, uh, or to uh, put those questions in the chat. So the, the video that we just showed was last night and I, I, was, I was out there on it, it was incredible. And, and I'm gonna share more of that video on, the, uh, on our blog later today. But you went out already this morning, didn't you? We did. And did it, was it the same? The same. It's, the conditions are still amazing. You guys, I, it's hard to explain right now. Normally this time of year at the site that they're at, you, it was like pick a place on the map where you would least want to go diving because the right. conditions are terrible. And what makes it terrible? It's just, it's deep. Yeah. It's right at the very edge of the island on a shelf break. It's where the currents get together and mesh. The waves stand up. It's just a very rough site, unpredictable. The current can pick up in a, in a heartbeat. So it's, it's, a, it's a good place for reproducing if you're a fish, but it's a bad place to dive a lot of times. Right. But, but the last couple of days, the conditions have been absolutely incredible. No current whatsoever. And because of that, the fish are banded up. They don't have to fight the current. All they need to do is think about, hey, who am I going to choose? Who's who, who am I going to reproduce with? And right. So they're up in that band milling around, which is, makes our job easy because we can get into that band with our cameras and get all the footage that we need to in a short amount of amount of time. Now, is it just NASA that are out there or are there uh, are other fish spawning there? Is it a yeah. important like? Right. Yeah. So so I should say and I know you you all know this, but. This is unique. There is nothing, what you just saw right now, there's nothing else in the Caribbean that's like that. Right. The, the Caymans are unique in, in what they've done to recover this resource. So they have these large spawning aggregations. So you all should feel proud of that because that's that's an amazing achievement and something that is that is nowhere else in the Caribbean. It's yeah. just here. Yeah. It is the case though, that it's not just Nassau grouper that are out there. So a lot of the, the protections that the Caymanian government has put into place have also benefited lots of other species, mm -hmm. including several other large grouper. It turns out that this nursery ward, as Dr. Cor Croy likes to call it, <laughs> this place of reproduction. So yeah, it's like a nursery, right? It's like a nursery. And so lots of different species come to this one site in order to reproduce. And species like uh, uh, yellowfin grouper, often called uh, rock grouper here, black grouper, tiger grouper, uh, uh, even we've even seen goliath grouper out there, although we don't think they're there to reproduce. We think they're there. You've seen goliath grouper out there. Goliath, and goliath grouper are like the size of a car. They're huge. I, they yeah. live up to their name. Yeah, so, so lots of different species reproduce, not exactly at the same time, at the same night, but within a week. Of each other they're all releasing their their eggs at the same time so it's it's it is a very critically important location for reproduction of lots of different reef spit reef fish species in, in the islands now um last night uh, i was out on the aggregation diving with you guys uh, a really incredible amazing mm -hmm. dive and i was looking for sharks and i didn't see any but i when we came back on onto the boat um Dr. Giddings was there and he, he had seen sharks. And I'm wondering, is that something that's common that you see out there? All the time. In fact, really? I, yeah, I just got off the boat, right? Yeah. And just came in here. Yeah, the last dive I was at, there was uh, a reef shark, got an eight or nine foot reef shark uh, out in the fish, just, just milling around. I have, I have footage of it. Maybe we'll show you all the footage of it. And we'll yeah, we'll, we'll, share, we'll share that footage maybe tomorrow. We'll put it on the, the blog. Yeah. So we regularly see sharks out there. I can tell you for a fact, there are way more sharks there, out there than we can see. Yeah. Because sharks are really good at not being seen. They don't typically like to be around people. Sure. You, you see these movies about like the sharks coming and, you know, it, it's just not how it is. Sharks don't want to be around people and they'll make themselves scarce mm -hmm. when divers are in the water. But when it comes to aggregations, there's a tension. They don't want to be around people, but if people are in the fish and the fish are their food, you're going to see sharks. And so we see them pretty often. Well, and we have a, a, a question from Cayman Prep, that just essentially what we were just talking about. How do the groupers deal with various predators in that area, like sharks? Do, what happens? Yeah, so uh, a lot of them get eaten. They or, do. Or get bit. Yeah, it's, it's, we see it all the time. Um, especially on nights of spawning mm -hmm. when they're actually releasing their eggs. And, and why is because when they're releasing their eggs, 
we think one female, there could be more. We're not sure yet. It's still, we're still doing science, right? We're learning all the time, all the time learning. We see one female go up and, and all males go up at the same, not all, but many males go up at the same time. And then they're all releasing their gametes. And that, that when, when there are many spawning bursts like that, the visibility drops because there's just so much stuff in the water. And between the visibility dropping and all of these group are rushing up in this big mass, that's a great opportunity for a shark because the yeah. group aren't thinking about sharks. They're thinking about... It's a buffet. Yeah. So the sharks are, will will attack right as the eggs are being released, which makes... A, it's incredible to see, right? See, so you see all these groupers shooting up and here comes a shark, boom, right. and it attacks the big spawning burst. And we've seen that happen and a shark will come out with a big grouper in its mouth and it's jumping on the grouper and its eggs are spewing out. It's crazy to see it. It's true. It's we amazing. we actually saw there. I, I can't remember. It was a couple of years ago. We were coming back from one of the dives, and one of the uh, one of the boats had found a, a grouper that had been chomped on. Like they yeah. they 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 saved him, right? That's right. And that and that was essentially what had happened with that with that grouper. He he. It looked like it was a shark bite. He'd been yeah. He'd been he'd been bit. We see we see fish with wounds all the time. I see. I, I don't think. I mean. Is it going to be a huge population impact? Probably not. I mean, you know, it's nature. Sharks got to eat, right? Well, and I've seen plenty of video um, for doing this project where you see the sharks, you know, dive into the, the, the ball but miss. Like, they're, yeah. they're not always catching the fish. They miss more than they catch. Right. Yeah. Okay. We, and that's, that's mostly what we see is the sharks not, not, not being successful for sharks. Um, Cayman Prep wants to know if you've ever been bitten by a shark. I have not. No, no, no. no like, like we talked about, sharks don't want to be around humans. No. So even yeah. down there, even at the aggregation site, they Nassau have no probably interest. looks a lot tastier. Than... Oh, yeah. 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 yeah if, if you're a shark, you definitely, a NASA looks tasty, a human, you, they, they know enough to know that humans are not the thing they need to be around. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. Um, we have one more guest that I that I want to bring on. Bryce, thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. It's great to see you. So um, there are other uh, researchers here on the project that are doing various things. And like I had said before, we don't just see Nassau grouper out on the aggregation. We see other types of grouper and other fish. Um, so I, I want to invite Janelle to come up and talk about, um, I believe, tiger grouper is what you're working on. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Or you can talk about yeah, whatever you want that you're working on the project. So could you introduce yourself and say, you know, what you're, how you got here, sort of the pathway that you got to here first? Yeah. So I am a full-time graduate student at Oregon State University. Woo! <laughs> um, I'm in Scott Hapel's lab and he's another, I guess, PI on the project. And within, under Group Moon, there are many different research projects happening um, at the same time. We already talked about fish faces and stereo videos. Yeah, so it's not just, they're not just right. out there counting. Like there's men, yeah, much there's data many that's- Yeah, there's different things happening, yeah. And so my avenue really looks at the early life history stages of Nassau and Tiger Grouper um, and Yellowfin Grouper as well. Um, and early life history stages, meaning like literally once they are spawning and they become fertilized eggs, mm -hmm. that's when I'm really looking at them and seeing how they progress over the next like week or so. Um, and basically I'm seeing how climate change can impact or more specifically increasing temperatures can impact the fish at those early stages. So how do you measure that? Like what, what is it that you actually do to, 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 to study that? Mm -hmm. So I look at a couple of different things. Some is just like straight morphometrics. We, what does that mean, morphometrics? So um, once we have the larvae, we store them in different preservatives, take them back to a lab, and we can use a microscope to take pictures of them. So and, you've created a lab actually, yeah, actually in, on, in, in the room that we've rented here yeah. on the island. And um, you guys, I, I'm gonna take pictures of it and I'll post it on the, on the blog so you can see. But what you're actually saying is, when they spawn, you're gonna go out and capture some of the eggs. Yes. And then what do you them. and then what will you do with them yeah, in so the tanks? We'll bring them back to the lab, put them in different temperature treatments in each aquarium tank that we have built um, in this Airbnb kind of. Yeah, I mean and, it's a makeshift uh, yeah, research lab, right? Yeah, exactly. It's pretty awesome. Yep. And so each day we'll um, 
pull out samples and store them in these preservatives so we can take them back to another lab back home and see we can take pictures of them and see how are, is like their length changing how is their um like are they pigmenting earlier or what does that mean pigmenting is when you start to see coloration in their body um so that's kind of like de a development yes yeah, development stage. you're right we okay. can see how they're developing over time over usually like a six day time window so this isn't your first time here you were here last no, year yes, right yeah so are you ex tell me a little bit about what did you have any um ahas or or you know what did you take away from last year and what are you hoping to build on this year yeah so last year um i like i did notice there are a lot of developmental changes um in different temperatures when they're um, so you did see that when you yes, when you had them in different temperatures mm -hmm. you were seeing that they developed differently right and uh, but another interesting thing is that so we target individual females when collecting so we have samples from four different females and we can see that some individuals produced from certain females do better than others mm. and so that leads into like my second question is like are, which involves a lot of genetics, but we're basically seeing like, do certain females have better genes essentially than others? And if so, it's really important to keep the population as big as possible. Right. So the future um, populations have those good genes that can deal with climate change issues a lot better. And so it's a really big project to support the fight for keeping the population so big so we, they can do better with um, other issues. like. A lot of the work before has been done to um, get the aggregation site as bigger as as big as possible, so it can recover. And now that we're seeing recovery, especially here on Little Cayman, we're looking at other questions like climate change and other issues that could be happening out here. Awesome. So I, I know that we have some Year Twelve students on here that might be thinking about going into uh, marine sciences, or yeah. and so I was wondering if you could just tell. Uh, a little bit about your story like yeah what inspired you what what were the first steps that got you to mm -hmm. be here yeah so i grew up in more of a rural area nowhere near the ocean um just a couple <laughs> where where were you um, pennsylvania like Pens rural pennsylvania okay and so i didn't even know this was an actual career possibility i had no idea people did this for a living I yeah didn't know, <laughs> yeah i didn't know you could make money so off what of it. happened um, I ended up going to school out of state and I went to school in Virginia and it's really close to Virginia Beach and right on the water. Okay. And I was there actually to study biology on a pre-med track because I like science. I just didn't know what to do with it at the time. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, be a doctor. So that's what <laughs> so Everyone said, be a doctor. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I went for. And my first wow. year, I like hated it. I, did, really? I didn't like yeah. anything that um, I was Told to take sort of, mm -hmm. um, but I took a few electives. We had a department called Marine and Environmental Science, and so I took a few electives in that class or in that department, and pretty much switched my major as soon as I really? realized how great it was. Yeah, um, and so I was volunteering in a lab over there, which brought me to a conference called American Fishery Society. It's an international conference mm -hmm. on a bunch of different scientists that study fish. Mm -hmm. And that is where I met Scott Hapel, who works on this project. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about um, my personal interest for research and his, like what he does in his lab. And I also love to travel. So as soon as I heard like what he was doing, I was like, I have funding, I can come. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, please take me on. And it worked out um, ever since then. So I, I moved to Oregon to um, join that lab and I didn't get to come to Cayman my first year, mainly because I started during COVID. So oh, yeah. 2020 really. <laughs> In fact, one of didn't one of the other students wasn't able to come because they yes. they got they tested for COVID. Mm -hmm. So that is um, one big challenge. Nothing can nothing goes as planned half the time. You have to be <laughs> very adjustable in this field. I feel like. But, you got to roll with it. Yeah, you kind of roll with the punches, and so. But it did work out in the end. I didn't get to go my first year, but last year I got to go. And um, I was here in January and February because it was a split moon. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also got to come back this year to kind of expand my studies a bit more. Last year, I primarily focused just on NASA. This year, I'm also looking at potentially tiger grouper as well. And that's something we, we do see a lot of tiger grouper out there at, on the aggregation. And I see a couple of questions. One of them, um, what, what would happen if you caught a NASA grouper? Well, 
my hope is that you wouldn't be out there catching Nassau grouper right now because um, it's during the spawning season. So people are not supposed to catch them. And if you happen to, I would, um, I would hope that you would release it immediately. Um, but they're outside of the, the spawning season, you can catch grouper and there's catch limits uh, that have been um, created by uh, the DOE and, and reef as well um, uh, for, you know, you can't catch, grouper that are too small because um, they need to at least be old enough to be reproductively of reproductive age before you can catch them, those types of things. So you can catch them, um, and, uh, but not, not right now, not during the spawning season. And I would tell you the exact uh, dates of all, or like when the catch season ends, but um, all of our DOE folks just took off. So I, I, I will find that out and I'll post it on the blog for you. Um, what are the cons of working in the marine biology industry? I'm going to let you talk about that. What do you um, think? Well, I guess I love it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're so, biased. Yeah, I guess I'm biased. But um, it is a long journey, especially if you're interested in the research. Um, you know, most or a lot of other jobs, you know, you graduate college, and you kind of just go straight into your full time job. And here it's a bit different. If you're interested in the research, you end up going to grad school and potentially another time in grad school and maybe a postdoc. It could be. So how long, like what, is there an average like number of years of school that, or, or does it really vary depending on what you're doing? I think it varies. And that's, okay. I probably should have explained that too. Every person does not go through the same situation. What I did um, is probably completely different than what Bryce just did when he was talking sure. or what Coy did when he was talking. So we all go through very different paths. Um, but a lot of the time, like people do end up going to grad school and that can take a bit of time depending on what degree you're going for. Like a master's could be like two to three years or a PhD could be like four to six years. Um, yeah, just a I mean, so I, I would think a con then might just be, it's expensive, yeah. right? You're going, you're many years in graduate school, right? Yes. And it's not as, I guess, laid out like um, for other mm. professional uh, occupations, like medical doctors, you know, the track pretty is pretty like, clear. Yeah. You know, you're going to undergrad, you go to med school, you do a residency, et cetera. Whereas right. like something like this, you know, you may do a master's, you may not, you may go straight to a PhD, you wow. could do a postdoc, maybe you don't. <laughs> There's many different like paths that you could take and trying to navigate that and figure out what's best for you can sometimes be difficult because sure. Everyone does something different and there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just kind of what works for your situation. Wow. Um, if you breed two groupers with good genes, could you make a super grouper? I love that question. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Well, that's the, I guess, whole idea of my project. We're trying to see if um, certain individuals have, can express certain genes and a better way than others. And if we keep those genes in the population, that, you know, gives them a better fighting chance. So mm -hmm. with, is it a super grouper? I'm, <laughs> I don't know if we would call it that, but it does, you know, but they're healthier. But it grouper, does, yeah, the, right? it does give those um, individuals a better chance at fighting issues like climate change and increasing temperature. Well, and that's why we want to have such a big aggregation. Yeah. So that there is a, a wide variety of genetic right. material that's being shared. So you do have lots of healthy Grouper. Yeah. So what's what would what's next for you? Well, you'll you'll do this here, and then what what will you do? At, what will you do with the information, the data that's so, collected here? Right. So I will bring everything back to my lab at Oregon State University, and that's when I kind of I go through, take pictures of all the larvae we collected. I'll do a lot of the gene expression work I'm doing, and bring them to like this huge genetics lab, extract um, RNA. Sure, that's too uh, <laughs> detailed. Yeah. yeah, no, it's we'll good. Extract. We've got a year twelve here. They're, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do RNA extractions from each individual larvae, and then we can run it through this PCR, which basically ampl amplifies the RNA, and we can see, you know, how much um, of that protein is being expressed in certain individuals in temperatures compared to others. And so we're really just comparing to see if we, you know, if how much how how much the heat shock proteins are being expressed in 
higher temperatures compared right. to normal temperatures. And then if it's different between each female as well. I see. Yeah. So will that be, will that turn into a paper for you or does, does that end up that, that data end up somewhere? Yes. Yeah, so, and when you become a scientist, publishing is super important. So you're going to, um, like, I will eventually write this up and it'll hopefully be published yeah. and um, go somewhere for future scientists to refer to and to um, do their, like, they can reference this paper for their studies and other projects as well. And it would be cool to also do similar work for other species, like you said before, like tiger grouper or yeah. yellowfin as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for being Thanks here for and sharing me. with the kids, you guys. Um, thank you also for your questions. Oh, I've got a question. Can grouper get cancer? I don't know. I mean, I think that fish fish do get cancers. I don't know the, the exact answer to that question, but I thank you for it. And I will, I, I'm going to do a little... Um, uh, research on that afterwards, and I'll I'll post I'll post a, a more comprehensive answer on uh, on the blog. Um, but thank you for that question. Thank you so much for yeah, being here. So. Um, that's going to be it for us today. Uh, please join us tomorrow, same time, same place, eleven o'clock. Um, we have a whole nother slew of scientists that are going to be here that you're going to get to talk to. We're going to look at some of the really great um, scientific tools that are being used out here on the on the aggregation to study the Nassau grouper. Um, we'll have some more footage. And then be sure to join us on Wednesday where uh, we will be um, going live from Bloody Bay Wall, a uh, famous dive site uh, here on Little Cayman. And you guys will get to see some of the beautiful and amazing uh, marine life that we get to that we get to experience out here. So thanks you all so much for being here. Came and prep, thank you for hanging out till the end. Have an awesome day. I'll see you all tomorrow. Go Grouper Moon.